Namaskar. In the last class we discussed what is decision making and we saw two different models of decision making. Whereas the expected utility model is a mathematical model which looks at expected values that is achieved by making certain choices. The descriptive model looks at shortcuts people use to make decisions. The descriptive model talks about how people make decisions in the real world and how people do not calculate probabilities of events happening and the utility of any option. This happens because most people do not have either enough information or the computing capacity required to make decisions. So, to make up for these losses, people use rule of thumb or certain shortcuts to make decisions. Now, the normative model depends upon how good something is to a person and what is the probability of that something happening. The something here is defined in terms of the alternatives for making a decision. Descriptive model challenges this view and suggests that people use past experiences and their memory information to make decisions. There are two methods of making decisions under descriptive model and that is the compensatory and the non-compensatory strategies. The compensatory strategy as would be evident by the name itself compensate weaknesses for good of options. So, strength of one option can be compensated for the weakness of other option and using this method people arrive at a decision. The non-compensatory methods do not compensate weaknesses and st strength of different options. We also talked about elimination by aspect and satisficing two methods of making decisions under real world circumstances and using mental shortcuts. Today we will look at the third kind of decision making which is the naturalistic decision making and we will also look at some biases that may happen in making decisions. Towards the end, I will talk about some methods of help which can uh, assist you in making better decisions. Now, we talked about mental shortcuts people use for assistance in making decision under the descriptive model. What are these shortcuts? These shortcuts are called heurists. The heurists are a method of arriving at results by not following all the steps that could lead to a possible solution. So, while using a heurist, people depend solely on their past experiences or memory for arriving at solutions. Now, decision makers, they employ a number of heurists or rules of thumbs that support rapid decision making. It may fail decision making in new or unfamiliar circumstances. Assuming that there is a decision that people make often. In those cases, if you employ too much of your cognitive resources in such decisions, the resources would be limited and you cannot divert these resources to other jobs. A simple example is dividing attention on two jobs. So, when you are driving a car and talking, if you concentrate totally on driving, the talking would not happen. One of the jobs have to become automatic. So, if the job is routine, people use shortcuts to complete this job. And 
whenever they get into a problem while completing this job they use certain memory and experiences to come up with solutions think about a situation where i have to open a tin can i may not have the tin can opener what would i do i could use pliers and some other pointed objects to make incisions in the can and open it using a plier and this kind of solution that i have employed here is using a heurist it could also be using the back end of a spoon to open up the lid of a tin can all these methods of opening the tin can that i am demonstrating is actually the use of heurist a number of heurists exist and one of the most widely used heurists is called the availability heurist so availability heurists are those which decision makers are influenced by the information that is recalled or available at the time of decision is made we tend to estimate the likelihood of event that readily come to mind to be higher availability availability heurist suggests that those information that come to mind quickly while making rapid decisions they bias our decisions in favor of the availability of this information whenever you try to make quick decisions you search your memory now a number of decision processes and decision making uh, examples would be available to you the one that you have used the most or the one that you can recount the most when you use those for making decisions this is called a availability heurist people have been seen to report that they have uh, some kind of experiences which never actually happened in their life now when these people were investigated it so happened that these people claimed to have experienced this event by looking at media who has been trying to feed this information that most people have this experience so the presence of media itself sometimes create environments which kind of provide a suggestibility in people that it is more likely that they have faced a similar event and recalling this piece of information which has been suggested by the media at the time of making a decision is an example of availability heurist events that are easily come to mind and are more frequent and that events that are difficult to conjure up are rare is a good rule of thumb the work of availability heurist happens in terms of how closely or quickly can you remember an event the more quickly you can remember an event the better use of availability heurist would be used those events which have rarely happened and those solutions which have, you have rarely used in making decisions would and that would not come to your mind would not be a subset of availability heurist so the use of availability heurist suggests that those events or those solutions which you have used in your recent past or because of certain feature of this event like saliency or uh, uh, frequency of use make them available to you more those events would be remember more now the strategy served well for ancestors who relied on previous experiences although availability heurist is used in a number of situations and a number of people use this availability heurist 
but in today's world it is of less use. The simple reason being that information is available everywhere and so it does not become difficult to access information. Availability jurist or the ease with which you can pick up information from memory was good for people in the days when information access was difficult. But in today's world when information is available in quite rapid frequency the use of availability jurist is a little bit debated. The third kind of decision making model that I will talk about today is called the naturalistic decision model. Now, the traditional models of decision making show very little similarity to how decision makers behave in the real world. In real world, alternatives may be uncertain and require quick responses as events are dynamic and evolving and competing goals may exist. The proposals of the descriptive theory and the normative theory suggest how people make decisions, but these are theoretical models and they cannot account for the fact that while people make decisions in the real world, a lot of changes may happen. While making theoretical models, I can come up with a number of situations which may affect the goal or which may affect our decision making. But these number of situations I have thought of may sometimes not work according to my plan when real life in decision making is taking place. This may happen because in real life alternatives may not be the way that they are thought about or they may change or evolve. Also quick response may not be promoted by certain situations and also the goal that we are trying to achieve may also change and because of this change of goals and the change of alternatives and situations a combination of all these three may not allow us to use the predictions of the normative or the descriptive model. So, a new kind of model was proposed by Klein et al and which is called the naturalistic decision making model. Now, in real world there may not be the right decision and the decision one may choose can change rapidly. Whereas, the descriptive model and the normative model talks about what is the right decision and what is a wrong decision or in terms of what is a benefit beneficiary decision and what is a non-benefit decision. In real life sometimes losing is equal to gaining or maintaining a status quo which is neither losing nor gaining is much better than losing. These kind of predictions cannot be obtained from the two models that we have talked about the descriptive and the normative. In real life situations losing may not actually turn out to be losing and it may turn out to be gaining and so the predictions that I might get from the two earlier models may not work in real life scenarios. For that very reason the naturalistic decision making model takes a different approach in explaining decision making. Naturalistic decision making studies individuals in the real world setting and seek to describe how they actually make decisions rather than defining how they should make decisions. It is more of an observation kind of approach where we look at people taking decisions and notice what steps they go through rather than making predictions based on data available and our own experiences, we see people making decisions and based on that we develop solutions to certain problems. So, naturalistic decision making is about observing people in their own environment. It is quite similar to the idea of user centric design in which you, you see the user in their 
actual work environment and from there you try to develop solutions or mental models through which people solve problems. So, Klein and his colleagues have proposed the recognition prime decision making model of naturalistic decision making to describe the decision making behavior of experts working in time sensitive environments. A model called recognition prime decision making model has been proposed by Klein and the speciality of this model is that they study people making decisions in real life environments and in environments where they are under stress and time pressure. In real life there is no retake, there is only one take and time is of essence. So, all the proposals from the earlier two models may not actually function the way it should function in real life. The recognition prime decision making model is one approach which studies how the proposals of the earlier two models function in time sensitive and stress environments in the real life. The model presupposes that individuals making the decision is an experienced professional who when confronted with a situation can readily generate one or two alternative solutions based on his or her experience with similar situations and rules stored in memory. One of the propositions of the uh, recognition prime decision making model is that people who make decisions are experts in their field and these experts have enough experience and knowledge. So, when they get into a difficult situation, they can at will generate couple of alternative solutions to the problem at hand and how do they get this solution? This solution is something which they have tried before and it has worked and since it has worked in the past, this is stored with higher priority in their memory. So, while they get into a problem, they can easily pull up these solutions and try the most optimal solution for any situation. It could be true for people who are working in the fire department or it could be true for people who are working in uh, um, management office or people who are working on, on the uh, factory floor. Although there are guidelines of how decisions should be made, in real life those guidelines may sometimes not work and so what experienced professional would do is through their experience which they have collected while working at different plants and while working at different situations come up with different solutions. Then rate these solutions in terms of the effectiveness and then use these solutions to solve problems at will. This is one presumption or presupposition of the naturalistic decision model. So, how do these experienced professional come up with this alternate solution? The answer lies by understanding that these people recognize similarities between the current situation and the past encounters. The more similar the present situation is to the past encounter, the more probable that the solution which has worked in the past is going to work in the present. The professionals can identify an appropriate response. So, by looking at what has worked in the past and what solutions it led to by doing what response and how effective it was, experienced professional select a response and a course of action. In more complex circumstances, they may, re may rely on mental simulation. So, when situations are complex and an easy solution may not be available, in those cases these experienced professional use a mental simulation and from those mental simulations are able to come up with solutions by mentally manipulating certain scenarios. Then finding out the probability that these scenarios are going to work and what kind of solution they would give. What is mental simulation then? It allows the decision maker 
to make inferences about the positive and negative out outcomes associated with different decisions. Mental simulation is a situation where people in their head come up with various options and various scenarios as to how the solution would work. And not only this, but also what would be the positive and negative of each solution. How do they come up with this solution? By using their own past knowledge of the system, its component and the interrelationships to predict its response. Not only they use their own memory in terms of whether a solution has worked or not. What they do is they would see the system in use and try to find out how this system and system components are related. Based on the system and the system components and the relation between these two, they come up with a number of solutions and then give a value to each solution. This is how they come up with optimal solutions in the real environment. Now, the process of comprising and matching the current situation to the past encounters is hypothesized to occur relatively automatically with little conscious awareness on the part of the decision maker and without the evaluation and generation of alternatives. Since this matching process of looking at a present scenario and mapping it with a solution earlier has to happen very rapidly, the process mainly becomes automatic. Now, we are aware that if a process becomes automatic and requires less attention, it goes a little bit out of our conscious awareness. It becomes unconscious. Here too, when naturalistic decision making is being done by an expert, the search of alternative and the generation of solutions become partly unconscious and becomes partly automatic. It is not that the expert has to deliberately think about how the solution should be. The process of mapping the present, present situation to the past situation and finding similarities between the two, two situations and also generating the list of solutions in terms of the efficacy is an automatic process. In all, naturalistic decision making is a process through which we come up with solutions from our memory and use them in real life world. It may be solutions which are provided through the earlier two models or it could be a unique solution or a boiled down version of the solution which has been provided by the earlier two models. So, we have looked at the three different models of making decisions. Now, let us look at some of the problems in making decisions. These problems are called biases. So, how do biases generate? Biases happen when people encode certain information in a certain way. Stereotypes and prejudices are good example of biases. The information which is available to humans, they suffer from mental manipulation. Whenever we encode information, we encode it in a way which is preferential and helpful to us. This process of encoding information which is preferential to us is called a bias. One good example of bias is called the first information effect. Now, if you have a list of adjectives to define a person and the first adjective itself is a negative adjective, give this list to a person who later on would evaluate an hypothetical person based on this list of adjectives. The very fact that a negative information comes at the top of the list helps this person who is making a decision to form a negative image of the hypothetical person. So, information the way they are presented to you sort of manipulates how you see or how you process other information 
related to the object or event under consideration. So, bias is a problem. There is a lot of way to reduce bias. Let us see some of the biases which happen while making decisions. Experimental psychologists have identified a number of common systematic tendencies or what is often called biases that derive from the use of heuristics. When we use heuristics, we use shortcuts and these shortcuts then lead us to form biases. Let us take an example. So, you hear a news which says people from a certain community are doing certain illegal acts and the media has been rolling this news over for some time. The next time you meet person from that community, the first thing that comes to your mind is that he possesses his qualities. And so, we rate people according to different qualities which have been made available to us by the media. This way of quickly grouping people into certain classes is called biasing. Now, this kind of biasing would also prevalent in uh, decision making. I am going to define some of these biases and I am also trying to explain these biases to you. So, the problem that arises when individuals attempt to solve novel problems is a bias in hypothesis generation. The hypothesis that people make for solving problem that itself get biased and if the solution gets biased because of the generation of the hypothesis itself is biased, this would lead to problems. The bias is called confirmation bias. So, when biases happen because there is a shortcut which we have used in generating the hypothesis to solve a problem and because of that we have accepted a certain fact. The solution which comes out of it is known to suffer from confirmation bias. What does it do? It refers to the finding that human decision makers are more likely to entertain hypothesis that confirm a belief rather than ones that would disprove it. When we get into a confirmation bias, we try to accept those solutions which confirm to our belief, to our predictions. We only solve and try to sort those information which is in line with our hypothesis and that leads to bias. So, when people take sides, one side fights with other side, taking side itself is a confirmation bias because when two people engage in some kind of a fight, each people will see their own merit and they will try and sort information which will support their merit and that is how teams get into confrontation. One example of the confirmation bias is the rule identification task. So, Watson gave people a rule identification task in which people were presented numbers like 2, 4, 6 and then students were encouraged to ask question. The reply to the question would be only in yes and no and the job of these students were to find out the rule which governed these three numbers 2, 4, 6. So, students kept on asking whether 4, 6 and 8 are next numbers and the response was yes. The question was whether it was 8, 10 or 12 follow this rule, the answer was again yes and so all these kind of questions were asked by students. Later on, most students suggested that the rule underlying 246 was that the next number was 2 added to the previous number. So, 4 becomes 2 plus 2 and 6 becomes 4 plus 2. To this, the answer was that this was not the rule. The actual rule that the student should have found out was numbers were put in an ascending order. So, whether it is 2, 4, 6 or 6, 8, 10, they were all in ascending order. What most students were doing is, they were looking at the fact that these numbers 
were differentiated from each other by a value of 2 and so they kept on testing this hypothesis. Instead, if they would have challenged this hypothesis by asking whether 10, 9 and 8 follow this rule or some other question which challenged the hypothesis that adding 2 gives the next number, they would have found the rule. So, confirmation bias is a principle where people find support for their belief and they add on to it and due to this they come up with solutions which are biased or which are incorrect. The literal literature uh, suggests that knowing the outcome does cause people to believe that they could have predicted it. Thus, presumably that they would not have suffered the same consequences and this is known as hindsight bias. Another bias that people fall into while making decision is called the hindsight bias. It is known that people's hindsight is always 20 by 20. What is having a hindsight 20 by 20? In simple terms, having a hindsight means that if I provide the knowledge of a result, it would be very easy for you to say that I knew it all along. And that is why the hindsight bias is sometimes also called as I knew it all along bias. Let us say that an accident happens and the team which is working on the accident write a report. The report is too detailed which will tell you what was the problem with the driver, what kind of situations he was uh, getting into, what were the environmental conditions, what was the condition of the car, what was his own condition, how was he driving, all this information is available. And lastly, the suggestion suggests that the accident happened. You will be quick to jump saying that I knew that the driver had a problem and I would not have this kind of a bias, this kind of an accident. You would not even give a moment to think that the information that is being given to you right now was not available to driver. For example, there was a malfunctioning traffic light and it went on too quickly, but the driver who was driving the car on that day did not knew it. Because of that, he moved his vehicle ahead. But two lights which were the go light they became on at the same time and because of this this accident happened. This information that the light was malfunctional is provided to you post hoc after the incident has happened and because this information is available to you you could very well say that the driver did not see the light. But if you would have been in that situation this similar problem would have occurred because at the point of driving, you would not know that the, drive, that the light was malfunctioning. This kind of approach where people tend to claim that they would have performed better in situations where they know the goal or the outcome of a decision is called a hindsight bias. Hindsight bias highlights the importance of seeking independent feedback when doing things such as asking a doctor's second opinion or having your house or car appraised. Because knowing the result tends to bias you or motivate you in thinking a certain way, it is always good to have a second opinion. And while taking a second opinion, it is always advised not to tell the opinion of the first doctor or the first company which assesses your car to the second company or the second doctor. The moment you tell the decision of the first doctor, the second doctor will become biased and he would have his decision aligned with this decision of the first doctor. This will both comprise the hindsight bias. So, hindsight bias is also relevant for those investigation accidents because knowledge of the circumstances and the related outcome may make the accident appear more predictable or more avoidable and the actors more negligent.
as I just explained. Since you have not been given too many details, you would believe that the accident happened because of the negligent driver. Whereas, in real life, this is not the case. The accident may have happened because of other reasons. And since you were not aware of these other reasons, and these other reasons are only evident to you, after the accident has happened and you know that the accident has happened, people tend to be biased in claiming that the driver was negligent. Simply knowing about hindsight bias is not enough. Only when participants reflected on how the outcome might have turned out differently, hindsight bias reduces. So, there is also a way to reduce this bias. And that is by telling the people who are evaluating what kind of alternate solutions would have occurred, what kind of alternate results would have occurred. And when this kind of knowledge is provided to people, the hindsight bias would decrease in larger degree. Participants are able to develop more reasonable judgments regarding the likelihood of an event taking place and probability of similar outcome occurring in future. The reduction in hindsight bias, if people are provided all the outcomes possible in a particular incident happens because people will get a fresher look to look at the event. They will have more number of options and their judgment would then be more reasonable. If the judgments are more reasonable and the probability that other outcomes may also occur, these two combined together will reduce the setting of hindsight bias in people. Another popular bias which is known to affect decision making is called the anchoring bias. This bias is also called the anchoring and adjustment bias and what it simply means is that wherever we anchor our decision, this anchor decides how conclusions can be drawn from this decision. Let me explain. So, <clears throat> you go to your grandfather asking money for an ice cream and he gives you a 10 rupees note saying that you enjoy the ice cream and whatever returns you give it back. You laugh at him saying 10 rupees you will not get anything forget returning back the money. Why has he given you 10 rupees? Do you think that he is a miser? That is not the case. What has happened is in his time 10 rupees was too much money. You would get ice creams for 1 rupees and 10 rupees would be 9 times higher plus the ice cream. So, what happened with your grandparent is that he created an anchor at 1 rupees which was the price of this ice cream when he was young and then from there he adjusted the price of ice cream today. What your grandparent did was he thought about all possible things that would happen and how much the inflation would have happened and how much the increase in price of the ice cream would happen. And based on his calculations, he makes a supposition that at the maximum the price would go to 5 rupees from 1 rupees. So, you would still left with 5 rupees which you can return back. But this is not what has happened. The world has changed and in 10 rupees you do not get anything. The kind of problem in the decision making of your grandparent is called the anchoring and adjustment bias. You have often heard lawyers arguing cases and they ask for maximum sentence possible. They very well know that this maximum sentence possible is not something that the judge will award. So, why are they claiming for it? For one simple reason, the higher you go, even if the judge cuts down something, 
or cuts down substantially in your proposal, still you will get more higher than what you would have assumed. So, if you ask for 40 percent present term, 40 years present term for a person, you will at least get 10 years present term. If you start with 10, it will definitely be lower. This method of biasing is called the anchoring bias. Now, knowing or seeing a value, even an irrelevant one can influence one's judgment. Studying investigate studies investigating this phenomena is called the anchoring and it demonstrates that the effect are robust that is it influences many type of judgments. Now, remember an experiment in this where people were given a casino game in which they have to throw a ball and the game's needle would always go to either 10 or 60. So, people played this game and they either got 10 or a 60. Two questions were asked for people who played this game. One, what is the percentage of countries from the African nation in the United Nation? and whether there is a representative of the African nation. People who got 60, they use 60 as the bias or the anchor and they suggested that number of people who number of countries would be somewhere around 45. On the other hand, people who had 10, they suggested that 25 percent people or African nation would be represented in the United Nations. Neither of this result is correct because there are only 24 percent representation of African nations, but this demonstrates how anchoring yourself into certain values can lead you to miscalculation in terms of the actual number and this could lead to a faulty decision making. Now, the effects of anchors are observed in novices as well as experts. It is not only new newbies or people who are taking decisions for the first time that are affected by biases, experts also get a influenced by these biases. Now, experts are affected in task relevant domains. Even when participants motivation is manipulated by offering cash rewards or accuracy. This kind of anchoring biases are seen even if people are motivated to take certain monetary rewards while making decisions. Even then this kind of anchoring biases occur and this happens because these are very rigid biases. Now, when integrating multiple cues or pieces of evidences, decision makers are more strongly influenced by information that is present first than by information which is present later, which is called the primacy effect. While making anchoring biases, primacy effect plays a major role. Those information which is presented first are remembered highly then those information which later on are added. Remember we talked about how the first adjective or first impressions are formed, it is along those lines. Also information or cues that stand up by the virtue of a feature that make them more salient may be given greater weight in decisions. In anchoring decisions or decision making per se, the saliency of the cue, how salient a cue is, how novel or how attracting a cue is, that biases people and people's decisions. So, both cue saliency and the primacy effect in cue or the position effect of cue play a role in decision making. 
another kind of bias is called the overconfidence bias. This happens when people have a overconfidence in what they say. Ask any driver around you and ask them how good they think they are. Most people will rate their ability to drive higher than what their actual ability would be. If that would not be the case, then there would be no accidents. So people have overconfidence and these overconfidence in certain situations can lead to biases. Overconfidence represents a discrepancy between one's perceived and actual ability and skill. Although most of us have confidences in our abilities, our estimate of our abilities or our confidence in our judgments are often wrong. This happens because we trust ourselves too much and we believe that we can do far better than what other people would have done in similar situations and because of that the overconfidence bias happened. This bias can easily be seen in the predictions of NASA which when they got their first space mission they suggested that the Apollo mission would have a failure rate of 1 in 100,000. But when the first accident happened, they brought this failure rate to 1 in 1,000. Initially, NASA was very overconfident that none of their space missions would fail. And when a mission actually failed, the calculations which were done led to the lowering of the success rate from 1 to 100,000 to 1 to 1,000. Now, because of overconfidences can possibly lead to poor decision, it is important to determine when an individual's tendency for overconfidence can be tempered. Overconfidence can actually make you trust yourself more and take decisions which are drastic. So, a check in overconfidence should be done and is suggested. Fortunately, Overconfidence can be reduced through training and providing feedback about the accuracy of decisions. One way of reducing the overconfidence is providing training and that is why most doctors are provided this training so that they do not get overconfident with their diagnosis. Rather they take a second opinion or take the opinion of maybe the pathologist or the radiologist and with that come up with solutions to people's problem. <coughs> also providing feedback along the whole time that they are making decision can reduce the overconfidence bias. Now decision quality and strategy. How to improve your decision quality? Decision makers rely on various shortcuts resulting in bias. The use of less systematic decision strategies like heuristics by individuals might be expected to result in less satisfactory results. So when you are using a shortcut, obviously the decision would be a lot non-satisfactory because it may not work on novel situations or it may not give the kind of solutions that may be apt for any situation. So under those conditions of time pressure, Norm normative strategies, for example, satis satisfying and elimination by aspect produces decisions that are comparable or better than those produced by normative decisions. So, in those cases, the, uh, the shortcuts are good. Now, one explanation for this finding is that heuristics allow decision makers to win now poor choices relatively quickly. In contrast, normative processes are slow. So, when Quicker strategies are requ required. It is always good to use a heurist because they will give you those strategies which can help you attain solutions faster and higher success rate probability solutions. But they may not be satisfying, they may not be ideal because ideal and satisfying solutions can only be achieved through normative process. But using the descriptive process, solutions can be attained faster and better. Let us look at how experts and novices make decision. So, experts are believed to possess skills that allow them to identify correct and more efficient alternative solutions quickly and reliability. How do experts achieve this? They achieve this through better way of storing knowledge, using the long term memory and using strategies through the experiences which fit in a number of situations. But this benefit of experts 
of using desired skills and using shortcuts to get solutions uh, which are previously practiced and previously learned better. This may not work in certain situations. Let us look. So, experts memories are related to their move more efficient encoding of information in long term memory. Experts use strategies of storing long term memory like mnemonics and these mnemonics shorten the way how information is stored and accessed which circumstance the capacity constraints at earlier stages of information processing. So, by using these additional strategies the capacity constraint of short term memory or working memory can be bypassed. Now, avoiding short term capacity limitation enables experts to resume a task after an interruption from unrelated activity that would otherwise interfere with the maintenance of information in STM. By using the shortcuts, the experts could encode better and bypass this limitation. Also, when disrupted, they can stop the processing of information at a certain point and when the inter interference has gone away, they could resume the processing. So, they can use a go no kind of a strategy in processing of information. Experts store and index information in LTM in a qualitatively different manner than novices, allowing experts to readily recognize patterns by comparing the present circumstances to examples in memory. Experts in chess, they remember board moves and they store it in memory in such a way that when they see a board, they quickly identify what kind of move should happen. So, that they learn a number of moves and through mental stimulation they have a number of situations. So, when playing through the rule they are better, but when you violate a rule experts are of little use. The skill could be vital when time consuming deliberation of option is impossible and makes performance less susceptible to disruption by stress and other tasks. Experts are good when it is time relevant decision that needs to be made. Now, the improved memory skill of experts appear to be domain specific and they do not generalize to other tasks. Experts are experts in one field and this expertise cannot be encroached onto other fields. Experts ability to select only task relevant information facilitates their management of multiple demands because they do not burden the memory process with less important information. What experts do is when they look at a problem, they only look for those problem elements which comprises part of the solution. They do not read the whole problem and neither did they process the whole problem. They only process what is relevant and that makes them do a task much easily. Experts employ different metacognitive skills in monitoring their own thinking processes. Metacognition refers to individuals monitoring, controlling and organizing their own cognitive processes. Experts use metacognition which means the knowledge of what they are doing. And with this knowledge, they can then define how to encode information, where to store, how to access and how to execute plans. And so, this metacognition of knowledge about themselves or knowledge about their own actions help them in making quicker and better results. There are certain limitations of experts. For example, experts are not infallible and often fall short to optimal performance. When tested against a computer or a statistical model computer, they would not be better. Experts were better at generating hypotheses and developing sophisticated decision rules and guided by the superior knowledge were more effective in searching for information. Experts were often outperformed by simple statistical models. One explanation for the modest advantage of experts was that they were inconsistent in their weighing of different cues and made errors in adding them together. While adding cues, while finding optimal solutions or while making a complete extraction of information from all the available cues, ex experts sometimes fail and that is where computers win over them. Also novel situations which the experts have never, never failed before, they may also fail experts. So, how do we improve our decisions? What are the steps we can do? Two things, a training and a aid. So, what is training and what is decision aid is what is we are going to look now. Extended practice is necessary to approach performance levels comparable to that of expert in restricted domains. So, you have to do a lot of practice and lot of training. If you do that, you will achieve that level of sophistication which experts have in solving problems. 
Now, one way to improve human decision making is to provide support in the form of decision aids. So, decision aids can be provided. What are these decision aids? These are tools that help the human decision maker deliberate upon two or more options. Decision list aid is a list of simple protocols or computer generated options which suggest what you should do in a situation. If you do A, this is what you are going to get. If you do B, this is what you are going to get. So, if you are repairing a car, it would tell you if you repair a car in a particular way, these are the things that may go wrong or if you are looking at the car and trying to repair in another way, these are things which can go wrong and this is the benefit that you are going to get out of it. By looking at both the options and comparing, you will have a much better decision. One advantage of decision aid is that they do not suffer from cognitive biases. Decision aids are computer generated lists and so they do not suffer from computer biases for example, confirmation and availability bias and they also do not suffer from cognitive limitations of human processing. So, decision aids are simple, they provide you options and they provide you the benefits and negatives of each option. They also do not suffer from the cognitive limitations and biases and human related problems. Decision aid helps eliminate or reduce some biases, they can give rise to others. By trusting decision aids too much, humans would totally put all the decision to the decision aid and that is where a problem is. Think of a pilot who is using autopilot for everything and in those cases there are situations in which the autopilot may not take the right decision. For example, landing somewhere where there is uh, not permissible landing or landing in snow. Now, these decisions can be taken by the autopilot, but if the pilot is given the uh, task of taking the decision, he may not want to land his plane in a place just because uh, certain situations permit him to land. So, this kind of higher decision making has to be always done by the human. The human should use decision weights. Uh, in helping them in making a decision, but the ultimate decision should always be taken by humans. So, decision aids are beneficial, but at times they are also problematic. The appropriate use of these aids tends to improve performance and result in fewer errors than while human operators work without the aid. Obviously, if it is giving you a lot of solution, it is providing help for you and it is aiding your work. Operators can develop an automation bias or tendency to disregard or fail to search for contradictory information when a computer aid generates option assumed to be correct. If the computer is doing everything for you, human beings sit back and relax and does not find contradictory informations or those information which opposes what the decision aid solutions are and in those cases they will get into something called a automation bias or a tendency to trust the computer too much. Look at the uh, trust of people with AI systems like Gemini and uh, chat GPT. They are trusting them too much and then that is why when a student writes a paper using one of these automated uh, AI tools, they tend to get into problem because the AI has a written way or a known way of generating a response and that may not uh, be sufficient in certain situations. Now, the operator can become complacent, over reliant on the aids and more likely to differ to the choices or options provided by the aids even when they are incorrect. If you trust chat GPT to write your paper, what would happen is even if you know or you can see one error in the answer or a major error in the answer, you cannot correct it or you would not like to correct it just for the fact that you believe that these systems are intelligent and they know better than you. And so, in those cases, what happens is operator hands over all the control to these decision aids and they take all the responses. This may lead to poor decision making, incorrect decision making and due to that faulty choices which may lead to problems. So, this is what I had in today's lecture. We will meet in the next lecture to continue. Thank you and Namaskar.